Various countries have been in lockdown and uh, trashed their economies. Uh, businesses have closed for periods of time and, and going broke. Uh, the vaccine take-up has been slow in some countries and is now being forced upon some populations. And what I'm about to tell you now should be a concern for both the vaxxed and the unvaxxed. You need to listen to this. Australia are building so-called COVID camps to hold up to 2,000 people. The first is in Darwin, called Howard Springs. You know, um, a lot of people were concerned, even Australia, and jumped up and down about the Hoogars uh, being put in camps in China. Well... It's happening over here now, folks. And uh, who knows if it's going to come to Europe. In parts of Australia, you have to scan a QR code on a vaccine ID. It's not a passport, it's a vaccine ID. To gain entrance into certain venues and shops. And enter a different code for each item bought. The authorities now know where you've been, what you've bought, and how many you've bought. I think we can deduct that this vaccine idea has nothing to do with our medical health, can't we? With all this happening before our very eyes, I continue to hear from Christians that the tribulation has not begun. Perhaps they should have gone to spec savers. What they mean to say is the great tribulation has not begun. In my book, tells me there are three parts of the tribulation. There are seals, trumpets, and bowls. I believe we are in the times of the seals. That's my personal view and my standpoint. And I'm not sure we're even going to be around to see the Great Tribulation anyway. The Lord could come at any time and take us home to glory. Amen. But we need to be awake, folks. We need eyes wide open. There's a, a tract over there, a pile of tracts I wrote recently. And uh, I've named it Eyes Wide Open. Eyes Wide Open. Because so many uh, are closed. They're not seeing it. They're not understanding what's happening, what's going on. I keep getting quoted um, Romans 13 all the time. So I, I, I want, before I get into my message, I want to look at this quickly because we, we, need, to, uh, we, we need to put this to rest, actually. Uh, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath, on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes. For they are not ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due taxes, to whom taxes are due, custom to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. You know, there are two qualifying texts, I believe, to what I've just read you. One is verse 4. For he is God's minister to you for good. An example of not complying with that text would be Hitler. Amen? And I believe the other one is verse 5. For conscience sake. For conscience sake. So you need to know and understand why you're doing something. You need to have a peace about it. One thing the blood of animals and goats could never do was remove the consciousness of sin. But the blood of Jesus deals with this. 
deals with the mind. And so you need to know what you're doing and what choices you make for a good conscience. That's very, very important. Amen? It's interesting that, uh, that scripture. Are we all warm enough? Do you want that heater back on? Everybody warm enough? It's a bit chilly. I'll put this on for you. It'll be as warm as toast in a minute. There you go, Patsy, just for you. No, not at all, my love. <laughs> Matthew 22. 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius and he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Genesis 1.27 says we're made in the image of God. Amen. But sin mars the image of God. On our lives. The dictionary says ma means to impair the quality or appearance of something. That's what sin does. It defaces God's image in us. My challenge to you this evening is simply this. Render unto God that which is God's. Amen. Render unto God that which is God's. There's the title of the message, Mike. You know, when folks contact us, it's never to tell us how wonderful their lives are or how great they're feeling. Most people contact us because they need help. They need prayer. And uh, most people seem to think their issues are being caused through some demonic activity that they need deliverance from. And sometimes that is the case. But more often than not, for the believer, it can be a stronghold in the mind. And I think we have to know the difference between demons and strongholds. You see, you can cast a demon out, but a stronghold you have to tear down. And I believe the amount of fear that's out there today, there's a lot of strongholds in people's minds. Why have we got the worst uh, uh, numbers in Alzheimer's in the whole of Europe? You know, in dementia, what, what's that about? When God says he's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power of love and a... So what's causing an unsound mind? Would, do you think it might be a spirit of fear? There's so much fear around. We were discussing it only over a coffee just now. And so we need to look at this. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. For though we walk in the flesh, I'll, uh, I'll read from 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so, you see, we have to pull down those strongholds in our minds. And we have to see, you've often heard me say that, you can have a redeemed heart, you can love the Lord, you're born again, but you've got a heathen mind. You're still thinking like the old man. 
And what's happening out there in the world today is piling fear on that and anxiety on that. And one thing the Lord's told me of late is that we have to root down and fruit up. We've got to root down into God. And we were only saying earlier on over coffee, we need each other. So many Christians since lockdown have gone away from the church. They haven't come back. And yet we need to be meeting together, you see. The government have no right to stop us meeting together. Iron sharpeneth iron. You, you take a, 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 an ember out of a, a, a fire, it soon loses its glow. But when it's with un, other embers around it, it keeps warm, it keeps hot, it keeps red hot. We need to be red hot in this hour, hallelujah. Flies don't land on a hot plate, folks. And lukewarm won't do. So how do I know if I'm dealing with a demon or a stronghold? Well, a stronghold in the mind or anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Wrong thinking. You see, you have to think right, to feel right, to do right. I'll say that again. You have to think right, to feel right, to do right. It starts here. A stronghold doesn't have characteristics, personalities. Demons have personalities. A stronghold is not compelling. A stronghold doesn't hear voices. Are you dealing with a stronghold in your life? Or is it a, a demonic power? You see, most of our problems in life come from our thoughts, anxiety, thoughts on what might happen, rejection, thoughts, what do people think of me, low self-worth, thoughts of how I view myself, depression, well, all of the above, but you can add irrational fear. A good uh, example of that would be uh, false evidence appearing real, fear. False evidence appearing real. You see, you can't stop birds flying over your head. I was explaining this to somebody the other day who was struggling with their thought life. But you don't allow them to build a nest. You don't dwell on those thoughts. The enemy will put thoughts into your head, but you just reject them. You say, that's of the enemy. I reject that thought in Jesus' name. You don't dwell on that thought. You see, in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, the Apostle Paul is telling us here that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. What does he mean by that? Antidepressants. They're not carnal. You've got, you got problems. You, you, you know, Ritalin won't so solve it. Prozac won't solve it. Hallelujah. But they're spiritual. And they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And nothing saddens me more when people tell me they're a Christian and they suffer with depression. These things should not be so. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's not happiness. Joy isn't happiness. And you can't find peace outside of Christianity because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. You can be happy or sad as a Christian. You can be happy or sad in the world. But joy comes from deep within. It comes from deep within. Nothing changes. Your joy is constant. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And if you're losing your strength in your battle against the enemy, you've probably lost your joy. You need to go and find it, folks. You need to find it. So important. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The world goes for counselling and has coaches, life coaches, etc. But you can't bring your thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ if you don't know Christ. Can't be done, can it? So only a Christian can get free. Only a Christian can pull down these strongholds. It reminds me of two illustrations I gave one the other day at the prayer meeting. I'll repeat it. A person goes to the curtains in the morning and they draw back the curtains and they see an, an eagle chained to a tree walking round and round and round the tree. And where this eagle has been walking round the tree, there's a big groove 
where he's been tied up for months, maybe years. And they feel sorry for this eagle. So they go down and they, they cut the chain and the eagle soars off into the sky. The next morning they wake up and pull back the curtains and there's the eagle walking around the tree. No chain this time. But the groove in the ground is in his mind. See, that's what we have to deal with. This is the software we have to reprogram this with. And without the word of God, we'll never do it. The scripture says you have the mind of Christ. Do you? Do you have the potential to think like God thinks? Because if you do, you have the potential to think like, to act like God acts. It's an awesome thought, isn't it? But we have to embrace it. We have to live in it, hallelujah. Let me give you a, another Illustration of a stranger walking through a marketplace and he sees a cage with two birds in it. And the man who owns the cage is poking the birds with a stick. And there's feathers, they're flying, one of them is shivering in the corner. And this stranger says, that's cruel, set these birds free. And he says, they're my birds. I can do what I like with them. And the stranger says, what would it cost to set those birds free? And he says, you wouldn't pay the price. He said, well, what is the price? He says, every drop of blood in your body. And the stranger says, I'll pay the price. And the man in the market opens the door. One bird goes for the door and takes his freedom but the other bird stays in the corner, shivering, because he'd rather the devil he knows than the outside world, the devil he doesn't know. You see, our freedom has to be claimed. Our freedom has to be endorsed. Our freedom has to be embraced. And the devil's hoping that you don't know the word of God. He's banking on the fact that you don't understand the power of the blood and the power of the word of God. He's hoping, you see, the devil believes the word of God. He doesn't believe in the word of God. And he'll quote it, he'll misquote it. Quote parts of it, but not all of it. Romans 12. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. Now that word world in the Greek means aeon or cosmos. It means the spirit of this age. Do not be conformed to the spirit of this age. What, what would that be? Well, it, it's wokery, isn't it? Wokeism. It, you know, we don't have to buy into this wokeness it's a nonsense it's the spirit of this age but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God now some translations say test we don't test God we prove God and he invites us there's only one other place he invites us to prove him that's in our finances in Malachi prove me now on this if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, so much so you shall not be able to contain it. You can't outgive God. I've proved that many, many, many times. And he invites us to prove, to prove him by the renewing of our mind. Once we get this word in here, you see, what we have to get hold of is, are you warm enough now, my love? I'm boiling here. I'm, I'm melting. Are you sure? What we, have to, what we have to get hold of what we have to get hold of is that, is that when we start to think differently in the, uh, that the word changes our attitudes and our minds you see all of us are affected by our upbringings most people's struggles as an adult come from their childhood 
99.9%, you know. Uh, they're programmed from an early age. You know, you hear in this world, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. It's nonsense. Names can cripple you. Names can affect your whole life. Names you've been called as a child by your parents. You're useless. You'll never amount to anything. You believe your parents don't lie. And if you accept it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It becomes a curse over your life. It has to be broken. We, we have to start to view ourselves as God views us. Hallelujah. You see that the cross isn't the kingdom. The cross is a doorway. It's a threshold. You have to work out your salvation. And you have to start applying. You see, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The word became, Jesus became flesh. You see, this word has to become flesh. Do you see that? If the word becomes flesh, we start to think like God. We start to act like God. The scripture actually says not, not have faith in God, but have the faith of God in the Greek. And so we, we have to embark upon, the, we have to start somewhere. We have to say, Lord, change the way I think, change the way I act, change my heathen mind. You see, it's another message, but I don't want to go there now. But um, uh, we're, we're made in the image of God. So we've got a triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God. I, we, got, we got the freedom marchers down from Sirencester recently. I've been giving out heart newspapers. We, we've made friends with them. We invited them here the other Sunday. I said, I'll give you a meal. You know what's happening out there with this pandemic. You don't know why it's happening. You can only know why it's happening from the word of God. I said, so come down to the, the barn. I'll give you a meal and listen to a talk. And I'll give you a talk on, what, on why it's happening. And I went from Genesis to Revelation. You could have heard a pin drop in the room. They hung on my every word. They'd never heard such things before. I told them religion stinks. Who wants religion? The devil invented religion. Religion can't save you. Religion won't. I said, what you don't realize is you're in a religious war. This is a religious war. The Antichrist is going to bring religion with him. You're going to have to bow down to religion. And I gave them some examples of religion. Freemasonry. Black Lives Matter. Uh, Extinction Rebellion. They're all religions. Transcendental meditation, yoga, religions. You see, religion was invented by the devil. Christianity is relationship. Relationship. Relationship with God through his son. Hallelujah. And so we can prove God. That if we start to renew our mind in the word of God, we'll start to see our lives change. We'll clean up our mouths. We'll, we'll stop speaking negatives. And we'll start uh, uh, speaking blessing into our lives and our families' lives, our friends' lives. Hallelujah. The second one with the birds in the cage is about appropriating your freedom. Galatians 5.1 Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Romans 8 verse 12, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You see, God said through the prophet Hosea, my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge. It's lack, we have no excuse. It's all here in the word of God. We have no excuse. And that's a knowledge and understanding of the spiritual battle we are in. I believe Hebrews, uh, book of Hebrews says it all really. And, and this is where we need to be. You see, it's got, I, I meet Christians who've, who've known the Lord 20 years and they're still on the milk. I know some Christians who've been born again a couple of years, and they're on the fillet stake of the word. It's got nothing to do with how long you've been a Christian. And I believe that the biblical uh, concept is, is how long Jesus took to disciple his disciples. Three years. It shouldn't take longer than three years for you to be fully fledged and, and deep calling unto deep, plummeting the deep things of God. Hallelujah. Hebrews 5.12. 
For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Say, by reason of use, by reason of use. There's a saying in the States, use it or lose it. You know, I often say to people, if you've got it all, where is it all? By reason of use. People say to me, how did you get into the deliverance ministry? I just did for us, somebody else what somebody else did for me. That's it. I had to be set free from bondage. And I copied what, it, you know, most of this walk is monkey see, monkey do. It's no big deal. But when you step out and do it, you start praying for headaches, you end up raising the dead in Jesus' name. Not done that yet, but Lord, any time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Philippians 4.8, the reason Paul counsels us to dwell on positive things, like what is noble, what is just, pure, what is lovely, what is of good report, what is of virtue and praiseworthy, is for our mental health, isn't it? It's got to be, surely. It's for our mental health. There's so much going on out there now. So much propaganda and fear. We need to dwell on all these things that the Apostle Paul says to dwell on. Let, let faith build up within you. We have to claim your freedom. God's not in the business of ushering people through doors. Hello? God's not in the business of ushering people through doors. Revelations 3.20, he says he stands at the door and knocks that he might sup with you and you might sup with him. Let, let me tell you this. It's interesting to note that he's addressing believers. He's not addressing unbelievers. The Lord's knocking at your door. He's knocking at your door. Will you open it? Will you welcome him in? You see, we have to work out our own salvation. Sin. Explain to the freedom marchers that sin is what we are and sins are what we do. And I said to them, you could be born in a cupboard, you could live in a cupboard, and you could die in a cupboard and go straight to hell. Because sin is what you are. You're born with a sinful, fallen nature. You see, that is justification. The minute you step over that line and you say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. Cleanse me, forgive me, oh God. Come into my life. Change the way I think. Change the way I act. Take out my heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. The Holy Spirit comes in you. That's it. Justification. But sanctification is both a standing and a process. We walk it out. We work it out. You know, through life, through experiences. Sanctification is dealing with the soul. So justification is the beginning of your walk. Sanctification is the end of your walk. Do you see that? And so a lot of bondage. People say to me, well, can a Christian have a demon? I said, it's the wrong question. The question you should be asking is, can a demon have a Christian? That's the question. And the answer to that question is yes. The bondage is often in the soul, not the spirit, not the holies of holies. So a Christian can't be possessed because he's possessed by the Holy Spirit. But the bondage is in the soul often. 
That's what has to be dealt with. And what houses the soul? It's the appetites, the emotions, the will, your feelings. Jesus had something very powerful to say. I'll close with this scripture. About sin, what we do. And that's uh, Matthew 18. I'll read from uh, 7 to 9. Woe to the world because of offences, for offences must come, but woe to the man by whom the offences come. The offence comes. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. So if your mind, if your hand is always taking something that doesn't belong to you, cut it off. If your feet keep taking you to places you shouldn't go, the betting office, parties, nightclubs, cut them off. If your eyes keep looking at pornography or adult-rated movies, gouge them out. If your ears keep listening to ungodly music, cut them off. If your tongue keeps gossiping and lying, cut it out. If your mind keeps fantasizing and dwells on ungodly thoughts, decapitate yourself. For some of us, that just leaves a torso sitting on a chair. But if your heart is right with God and he's taken out the heart of stone and he's put in a heart of flesh, you're still going to glory. You see, then you will escape hell fire. Born once, die twice. Die in the flesh, then judgment, the lake of fire. Born twice, die once. Born of the flesh, born again, die and go to glory. I believe there are some body parts that need to be brought to the altar tonight to the cross I believe we need to hang these on the Lord and say Lord deliver me from these As John Wesley said that a person who listens to gossip is as guilty as the person gossiping because you're giving a vessel for the poison to drip into much of these things hinder us moving on in the things of God. And I want to say to uh, the folks here and those listening in on YouTube that if you know there are things you need to bring to the cross tonight, you need to make that prophetic move. You see, we, it's very important that we make that stand we you know Jesus said to the man with the withered hands stretch it out they said to the uh, the the, the uh, cripple at the uh, uh, at the temple uh, you know stand to your feet and what we have to get involved in what God's doing with us we have to make that prophetic act that's why it's good when when we get saved that we we make a step if you like a prophetic step out of our own life into our new life very important. And so I, I want to challenge you tonight that maybe you're not born again. Maybe you've got religion. Maybe, you know, 
when we counsel people, I, I, I don't say to them, are you a Christian? Because they say, yes, are you born again? Yes. I said, if you died this minute, where would you go? And they said, well, I, I think I'd go to glory. Well, why do you say that? Well, because I read the Bible regularly, wrong answer. Well, I, I sing hymns, wrong answer. Well, I pray, wrong answer. Well, I go to church, wrong answer. What, I'm here, what I want to hear is that I've repented of my sin. I've called on the name of the Lord. I've asked him to come into my life and change me. And I'm no longer the same person. That's the right answer. The rest is religion. The rest is religion. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, Jesus said. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Terrifying scripture, isn't it? Terrifying scripture. That come that day we thought we were saved and we found we weren't. Oh, my goodness. So I want to say to you tonight, if you don't, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit witnesses with your spirit that you're a child of God. You know if you're saved. And if you're not born again, don't leave this place without crying out to God. If there's one person here who needs to stand and say, Nigel, I don't think I'm born again. I've come under conviction, what you're saying tonight. I don't have that witness in my heart. If that's you, I encourage you to make a stand where you're sitting. Just stand up and I'll pray for you. If there's one person listening on YouTube, get off your seat and make a stand. Stand up now and cry out to God. Make that decision now. Very important. Do we all know the Lord? We're all going to glory. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, the next challenge I have for you is those that feel that there are issues they want to bring to the Lord and hang them on the cross. I want to encourage you to come forward and I'll lead you in a prayer. So whatever the Holy Spirit spoken to you tonight about, and I know there are some here he's spoken specifically to, that you've been dealing with this for a long time. And God says, tonight's the night for freedom. It was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Amen. So if that's you tonight, while we sing this song, I want you to come forward and I'll pray for you. And then uh, anybody else who wants healing in their body for anything will pray for the sick and minister to you. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let me be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, love you, Lord. And I lift my voice, lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my 